off the rugged west coast, a fishing boat with a six-ton catch is heading to port. Jeff's got less than 36 hours to collect the $60,000 load and move it safely to market. The weather's laid on some nice rain for us and it's coming across sideways. A brutal storm is lashing the island. And Jeff's driving straight into it. It's the snow, rain, frost, four scenes in one hour. Adding to his stress. You've got to keep watching every corner. Jeff must now conquer this. A five kilometre mountain road to the mining town of Queenstown. This is the famous Queenstown 99 Corners. A notoriously dangerous stretch of road. It's a bit steep and a bit slick. On one side, a rock face to chew into the truck. On the other, a sheer drop. Jeff's truck is four times the length of an average car and one and a half times as wide. Well, they're just fitting on you. Hanging a tire over one side and on the white line on the other. There's really not much scope for error when you meet something coming down the way. 99 hairpin bends. On every one, Jeff needs most of the road. Oncoming traffic, beware. Oh! Jeff stalled the engine. And now he's blocking the road. Death lock, mate. Lost a bit of traction, so we just have to bang the death locks in. So we're at the top now, and we have to go back down the other side. On the steep descent, Jeff needs to keep his speed in check. If you lose traction coming down the hill, you're, you're jackknifing. The truck ends up going one way, and the trailer ends up going the other. With tight corners. Uh, that looks like somebody's been over there. Drop-offs. Yeah, uh, somebody's been into that. And tourists to avoid. It's a test for Jeff's skills. Oh, stop it. Fishing boat Diana is just pulling in. It's all hands on deck to load the fish. Now to get it back to Hobart for processing. For Jeff, the return journey will be even tougher. It's the same mountainous route, but this time with a precious load. Feels like about 15 tonnes. Depending on what kind of weight you've got on, sometimes it gets a bit of a wiggle on it. You can throw the truck around a lot. The idea is to keep the fish upright and intact, but still get it down there as quick as we can. And making the job harder, nightfall. That side of the truck at the front is in the ditch, and the back of the trailer on this side is well across the other side of the road. Definitely don't want to be meeting anybody down here. With his wide load forcing him into the other lane, Jeff's on the lookout for distant headlights. If I see lights coming down the other way, and if that gives me a heads up that there's somebody else coming. Miss one, and there could be trouble. Descending the Tasmanian Highlands. This is the last serious drop. It's a big drop, it's a steep drop, but it goes a long way. Uh, it catches a lot of people out. It's about 14 minutes from the top to the bottom.
back to civilization. 11 p.m. and Jeff's made it to the processing plant in Hobart. No time to waste. The load is cleaned and filleted. While Jeff gets some much needed rest. Mike and Pete are in the middle of hauling Pete's precious cargo of eight rare tractors. You don't see too many road trains like this. <laughs> so something to see. They still face the daunting Nullarbor Plain. 2,700 kilometres of scorching desert highway to make it back to Western Australia. The further west we go, get to Nullarbor, all the rest of the forecast is sort of meant to be low 40s to mid 40s. The mission is far from over. The warmer things are, the hotter the engine's going to run, plus the quicker I go, the more the tyres are going to heat up. If the tyres heat up too much, they'll end up glowing. You know, that sort of temperature, I don't want to be out there changing tyres. In a few hours, they'll be crossing the border into Western Australia, a state that has the toughest biosecurity rules in the country. The state produces $4.6 billion worth a year of grains such as wheat and barley. The tough rules are designed to prevent the crops from being wiped out by noxious weeds and pests. And as agricultural machines, the tractors will be prime targets for quarantine inspectors. If the tractors aren't squeaky clean, Pete could be facing fines of up to $50,000. It's not just the two days of lost travel that's at stake. There'll be a $500 bill for each of the eight tractors if they have to be cleaned. At a final roadside check before the quarantine inspection station, Pete's anxiety levels continue to rise. It'd be very devastating. It'd be something very small or minuscule that they might pick up on. Pete gives the tyres a final forensic scrape for any tiny specks of dirt or plant life still on board. Oh, Pete's been a bit thorough about things. Yeah, you can't really blame him for that. Yeah, he just wants to get them across and get home, so do I. There goes nothing. All right, the South Australian border, one of the dreaded parts of this trip. Everything's been cleaned down and washed, but it's always a bit iffy being able to get past quarantine. So we just have to cross our fingers. Good, how you going? Ah, get out and I'll have a look. Mike's load of eight vintage tractors is a prime target for the eagle eyes of the quarantine inspector. Oh, I'd be lying if I wasn't concerned. We're all good. Thank you so much for that. No worries. Have a good one. Yep, you too. Home is still 1,200 kilometres and two days away across the mighty Nullarbor Plain the longest stretch of dead straight road in Australia. 146 kilometres of no turns, no towns, and sometimes no way to pass. Probably there in the Yeah, man. Yeah, there's a road train coming up behind you there, fellas. So, yeah, I'll just poke up towards you and, um, yeah, have a track when you're ready. Yeah, you, man. To complete the manoeuvre, they'll need nearly a kilometre of empty road. And for Mike, half of his wheels will be off it. On your left, guys. is a fallen tree and a blind bend. Can't see around it. 
He has a split decision to make. Hit the brakes and risk not stopping in time. Here goes nothing. Or go round and hope there's no oncoming traffic. He makes it. Boss Pete, travelling behind, is relieved his precious cargo of eight vintage tractors is safe. Dangerous where it is. <laughs> yeah. It's a prick of a spot. Finally, after six days and 3,260 kilometres, Mike and Pete's vintage tractor run is nearly over. Oh, I'm not far out of home. Last little piece of this journey is going to be in the dark. But that's all right. They've made it to Wagen in Western Australia. We're home. Finally. We're home. And no damage was done, which is the main thing, which yeah. is the whole... Yeah, that's the whole the objective. Yeah. yeah. The next morning, mission accomplished. Eight of the rarest antique tractors in the country safely unloaded at Pete's yard adding to what's already an amazing collection. It was a bit of a marathon, but we got there and your collection looks brilliant now. At Port Botany, a 50,000 tonne container ship is about to dock. And the 25-year trucking veteran will be there to meet it. Ready for the biggest challenge of his career. We've done a lot of homework on this, and a few little butterflies. We're just hoping everything comes together. For his customer, Rob Clifford, a nervous wait is almost over. Blowing the crane down now. At some point in the next 10 minutes, you'll just see it being lifted straight out of the belly of the ship over, over the top there. Mix oversized load appears. A 15-month-old Rothschild giraffe called Matundu. Three days ago, he left New Zealand and Auckland Zoo. One of only 1,600 left on the planet. It's up to zookeeper Rob to ensure Matundu makes it on to the next leg of his journey. This is special. If it goes wrong, you just can't go get another one. And so he, he's highly precious. He's very important to the breeding program. One of the biggest dangers is stress, which can kill these sensitive animals. No one knows how this first time traveler will cope. From Port Botany, Matundu will travel 300 kilometers through the night to his new home at Mogo Zoo. Is he gonna strap it all down there? Yeah. And the first leg of his Australian adventure is a risky 20 meter drop straight down. Mate, um, is this animal going to be spooked? When you're dropping your chains down the side, just don't bang and crash. Yeah, and... no, I'm going to try very much for that not to happen. But first, this fragile animal must be gently loaded onto the truck. Keeper Rob is still worried about his new arrival. If it's open, leave it open. Leave, leave it open, then they poke their heads out. If they can see what's going on, they don't freak out yeah. too bad. But he's just frustrated. Who are these people? Things moving over his head. We just need to get on the road. I'd, I'd say uh, the giraffe would have got scared because it scared all of us. Convoy sets off with four support vehicles, including power company workers and a team of zookeepers. My main objective now is to get him to his new home as quick as possible. We're just hoping not to have any more rain, that's all. We're going to lose a bit of visibility and we need to be able to see up on top of that crate, at least to get under these low bridges. is just outside the port. We're approaching it now. He has 
has just 30 millimeters of clearance and only if he picks the right line. The dead center of the bridge. You're gonna be very tight. We're through. Happy days. But around the next corner, another even tighter squeeze. Down the end of the yes, there's some power lines these guys have got to check. Yeah, mate, yep, okay. It looks a bit low. Mate, I reckon we're going to hit this one. I've got a feeling this is going to be a problem. That's freaking low. Far oh, out. Mick's passenger is also checking out the power lines. And then Matundu does the unthinkable. He takes a bite. Snacking on a power line could be fatal. Zookeeper Rob is on the scene fast. You right, mate? He grabbed, grabbed all the telephone line. A lucky escape. Just a telephone line. He just bit a hole in it. Matunda, which means the mischievous one, is living up to his name. Got a real fright. Thank God it wasn't a uh, power line or it could have been all over. It doesn't take much and we've got problems. We're not out of the woods yet, obviously. An hour in and the giraffe convoy is almost out of the concrete jungle. We're just on the outskirts of Sydney now, which is good because um, it's going to get a little easier from here. We're just trying not to jerk the truck around and make the rest of his trip a bit more comfortable. But as they hit the open road, the weather closes in. Visibility is down to probably 50 metres or less. We have to slow down in the fog, it's just no option. I need to keep an eye on that crate, make sure everything's uh, intact. Rather than risk the conditions, it's time for a break. So uh, we're just going to pull in here and have a bit of a spell. Go and have a look at our patient. Hey, dude. Hey, mate. Seems pretty happy, doesn't he? A few hours later, the fog lifts. Along with Mick's mood. I'm feeling a lot more relaxed this morning. It's been an eventful trip. And uh, we're not finished just yet, because we're only just over halfway. Outside the town of Berry. Power company workers arrive to clear the path ahead. I'm concerned about the time we're getting held up a bit. The permit for this job only allows Mick to drive until 8 a.m. After that, he could be grounded for the rest of the day. Not good for Matundu's stress levels. Really only got an hour and 10 minutes to get off the road. So I'm thinking at the moment we're going to blow out because I didn't need this at all. Yeah, not good. And Matundu is losing his patience too. Our mate's moving around in the back at the moment. I can feel the truck moving. I think he's getting anxious too. With the wires finally cleared, Mick's desperate to make the 8am deadline. 
All right, hey, Pop, we'll see if we can make up a bit of time, mate. We've got to keep pushing on, bud. Yep, yep. But this fragile load needs a smooth ride. These windy roads are slowing us up again. We're trying to make up some time, but we're not doing that well. I don't want to turn too sharp or anything to upset um, our passenger. So it's just, it, it is what it is. I'm hoping we don't get nailed. There it is, that's eight o'clock. Time's up. But taking an exhausted giraffe off the road for 24 hours, while Mick tries to get another permit, isn't an option. We're officially running hot. He needs to buy some time from the traffic police. Angus Mick, mate. There you go. We're gonna be, I don't know, maybe half an hour late or something. I'll uh, stop the yellow bound traffic, mate, so you get a, a run through. Just okay, thank you very much, mate. Bye-bye, right, Angus. That's for a good cause. A little bit of leniency. Who's gonna pull over a giraffe? But three days at sea and five hours on the road have taken their toll. Matundu has dropped out of sight. I don't know what's going on here. The zookeepers make an emergency stop. Had him for the last 15 minutes. I think he's right. He's just sitting down, but he's knackered like he is. he? Yeah. Exhausted, but okay. For the time being. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's all good. He's been really sleepy, and then he just went down. He's sort of bobbing, but we'll just get there now. The Tundu may be tired, but lying down for too long is dangerous. It can send too much blood to the brain, causing a giraffe to faint and choke. Hopefully he's going to stick it out to the end of the journey. Well, I think everyone's going to be happy to, to uh, close this job off, I think. Including myself. See quite a few people on Bateman's Bay Bridge. They're in luck. Police have stopped traffic. All right, mate. Thanks, mate. Thank you. After six hours on the road, a welcome sight. We've made it. We've made it. It, it's almost over. But has Matundu made it? It's been an exhausting two and a half thousand kilometre journey, but finally. steps on Australian soil. Home sweet home. He's up now, he's all right. For Mick, the biggest challenge of his career was worth it. You're a champion. You think you're very much better than you done. Absolute pleasure. On the mainland, Jacob Marshall's on a mercy run, delivering desperately needed hay to drought-ravaged farms in New South Wales. Last year, there was just cattle everywhere down here. That and now there's none. With little feed left, they're having to buy in hay from other states to keep their stock alive. 
I've seen firsthand how the drought has affected people mentally and physically. They've kind of lost their hope. Jacob's on an 1800 kilometre run from Nil in Victoria's south, hauling urgently needed hay to Glen Innes in New South Wales. So we're just running down to the farmer's paddock. It's a challenging load in punishing temperatures. Three trailers, 87 bales, with a gross weight of 90 tonnes all up. Comes at quite a large risk on hot days. Wheel bearings getting hot or overheating brakes or self-combustion. The wet hay under the fierce sun undergoes chemical reactions building heat like a compost pile and the bales can catch fire. The danger of his load self-combusting is not Jacob's only worry. Wind-blown embers from the bushfires burning in New South Wales are also a concern. I'll be just calling it as we go, and you have to be very careful of the load catching on fire or getting trapped in a certain area without expecting it. But with drought-stricken farmers desperate for his load, Jacob is undeterred. All done and loaded, and we'll get out of this paddock and get weighed and on the road. We'll just pull up in nil tonight and uh, get going early in the morning. Dawn and dusk are notoriously dangerous times to be on the road. Jacob will need to be on high alert for wild animals and oncoming traffic. Whoa. Suddenly ahead, a truck has strayed dangerously across the road. Scary. Yeah, but he shit himself. It's a bit of a funny day. Looks a bit overcast, but it's not really. It's smoke from the bushfires. Firestorms have ravaged Australia, burning over 39 and a half million acres of bush and forest, claiming 33 lives and destroying over 3,500 homes. Jacob's destination, Glen Innes, was hard hit. Two people killed, more than 40 injured, and 150 homes lost. Up ahead, another hazard of outback roads. We're just about to drive through a dust storm. And sometimes it gets so bad you only can see 50 or 60 metres in front of you. High stacked and high max, Jacob's load is under threat of being toppled in this dust storm with wind speeds of up to 80 kilometres per hour. The wind has really picked up in the last 10, 15 minutes. It's really throwing the truck around. They're trying to push you off the road. That's when you kind of start getting a bit worried. He's made it through the dust storm, but now Jacob's faced with another chilling reminder of the dangers of the job. A couple of weeks ago, a hay truck caught on fire just here. It had a collapsed wheel bearing, which caused it to drop embers everywhere and then it's lit three different fires along the way. Overnight, uh, Cobar had a pretty severe storm and it looks like it's going to be a little bit more during the day. If the rain gets any heavier, it will affect the load by getting it a bit wet and might add on a ton, two ton onto the load. It looks like everything's in order, so we'll be right to head off for the morning. Just coming up to the final haul into Inverell. Then we'll go to the cattle sale yards and split the trailers up. Jacob breaks down his rig and unhooks a trailer as restrictions only allow him to haul one at a time on the road into the farm. One trailer off and then come back and get the B-double set. To make it to John Sutton's farm, there's another obstacle Jacob must overcome. I've just got off the phone to John. It's going to be a bit of a tricky one getting up a hill. The hill's quite steep. I'll just put my cross locks in just in case. Give us a bit more traction up the hill. With the cross locks in place, 
all of the rear wheels will rotate at the same speed to hopefully provide more traction. Losing a lot of traction. Bit of a run up. I won't want to go up another gear. Losing a lot of traction. Nearly gonna just make it, I'd say. Looks like we got up. Kind of gets a bit of excitement for the morning. Hey, John. How you going? Yeah, good to meet you. Oh, we'll unstrap her and start to unload then, I guess. Yep, yep, yep. yep. For farmer John Sutton, the life-saving hay couldn't have come soon enough. A few showers of rain, actually, since I was here last. No, a few showers, not a lot. Yes, yeah, not really. Four million this afternoon, then we're going to have to let the road. Still need plenty of it. Heaps. Yep. His daughter, Kimberly is delighted by Jacob's arrival. We're very grateful for you. It'll uh, alleviate the pressure a bit. Recent rains have brought new life, but looks can be deceptive. Looks green here, but it's obviously just a green tinge with no feed cover at all, just no. mostly weeds and... Yeah, yeah, it's usually what happens, isn't it? And just nice crop of weeds that come through that don't have much nutritional value in them at all. So I got the first load off and uh, I'll go back and get my other trailer. The Suttons now have enough feed for their 200 cows for the next 10 days. Eight bales going out every second day. Happy day for the cows today. They'll come running down from the hills and that for that. Hey girls, come on. Uh, we do this every two days. Lucky you got a quiet mob. Glad I got it here and looks like we'll have to bring a fair few more. All right, we're all done. Unloaded, so I'll head off, go back home, bring another one up. Gotcha. It's a bit of a strange way to wrap up this drive in the rain, but it brings hope to these farmers. This week, Yogi's balancing two loads in three days all within striking distance from home. We've got a lot of different elements in this week that are going to make it a little bit complex, but I hope it runs all smoothly. From Katani, his first run is a round trip to a farm in Karoo, backed up with an urgent delivery from Cunderdon to Wajin. I just hope nothing holds me up at the start of the week. If I get held up at the start of the week, we're in a world of pain. Thursday morning, I've got one load that has got to happen. It can't not happen because it's going to a farming show. If it doesn't get in there by Thursday afternoon, we've got an unhappy customer. But a long list of obstacles risk hitting his schedule hard. Trees, cars, livestock, horrible roads. I've got to balance them all into the mix. Come out at the end of the week and hopefully we'll make a dollar. 3 a.m. Yogi and his cherished truck, PJ, have a big day ahead. After warming up, they've got over 1,000 kilometres to travel to stay on schedule. Racing harness on and we're into it. One mistake and three days of work could topple like dominoes. Fingers crossed we're loaded by 12.30. He needs a quick turnaround to make his tight schedule. There's my tractor there. How are you, bud? It's a sprint to get the tractor loaded. Yogi's still got 520 kilometres ahead of him to make his delivery in Katani and get back home to the family. Good result. Rattle. For the rushed return journey, Yogi's facing a dilemma. Do I go straight through Perth and chance getting caught in the oversized curfew? Or do we go around Perth, which is a lot slower and a lot harder on the gear? So, I'm in two minds. I really don't know what to do at the moment, so... 
And there's more at stake than just this load. The knock-on effect, if we get held up at the start of the week, makes me late for the rest of the week. But after making good time, he's feeling confident. I think, um, I think we'll go through Perth. On the outskirts of the city, Yogi's got 40 minutes to drive 30 k's. I want to have a couple of nice little light changes go my way. Of course we're going to stop in Joe. Not the start he was hoping for. How are you doing here? Right, come on, come on, come on. Stopping. If Yogi doesn't make it through the city by 4.30, he'll have to pull over for the night. Yeah, let's go. Because I've had a bad run through here. Just 23 minutes left to clear 20 kilometres of heavy city traffic. Everything chews up your time. This could be the first domino to fall in his tightly scheduled week. Right, yeah, we're not that far away. I can just about see the edge, but we're still in curfew. We're still close to running out of time. Uh, I couldn't win a trick, could I? Like, I've got to go left. But now we've got to stop. So. Every red light sees minutes ticking away, pushing Yogi closer to the 4.30 deadline. Right, eh? Let's climb this hill. And the hill is the end. I've got minutes to spare. While he's beaten the city curfew, he now faces a country one. I've got two and a half hours to get home, so we're chasing the daylight. Oversized loads can't drive on country roads after sunset. And only 60 kilometres from Katanning, Yogi's run out of sun. It doesn't look like I'm getting home. Sun run out of daylight. He's forced to pull over, just 40 minutes from home and his family. Hey, shit, I... It's an early start the next day to keep his schedule on track. He's finally made the last 60 k's to a farm near Katani where his customers are waiting for the tractor. No. Nah. No, nah, nothing at all. Yeah. A trickle charger might give the battery the jolt it needs. Yeah, that was a better click, but it's not... It's obviously trickling in there. Nah, she might need this, that little bit of a jump. Time for more power. Come on, big girl. Yogi desperately needs to get this tractor off his trailer. Ah. His next pickup is 300 kilometres away. And it's got to be in by 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So we don't have any leeway. He's powerless and running critically low on time and ideas. All the other thing we go to plan B is push it through, just roll. Once you get oh, it to yeah. there, it'll roll down. Try and put some more air in that. The only way to roll the tractor is to release its brakes by filling them with air. Yeah, I'm good. Eight tons to push, but Yogi's sitting pretty. I'm not doing a lot here. We're going good. It's about to go over the beaver tail, I reckon. 
We have a result. We got the tractor off and we can go to plan Z. After this delay, Yogi's plan can go only one way. More work in less time. We didn't have a good run today, so therefore I've finished for the day. I'm finished in Katani. So the, the bonus is I'm home. The negatives I've got to get up at 3 o'clock tomorrow morning. But that's all right. Another big day breaks for Yogi with another big load on the cards. It's oversized, it's 3.8 metres wide, so we need Amanda. Got the lovely wife and chief pilot on the job today. So I'm in safe hands when I'm with Amanda. Which is just as well. The slightest damage could have major consequences. This particular item is a full-on showpiece. So it's brand new, it's going on display, it needs to turn up in pristine condition. That's a lot of pressure for a yogi to bear. No scratches, no dents, no nothing wrong with it. This seed and fertiliser bin... Right, yeah. ..is worth $140,000. Yeah, come right up, come right up. Yep. Yeah. You can go straight on to that, Mick. We got it, eh? Right, eh? Next, the town of Wajin and the biggest agricultural show in country Western Australia. Woolarama is on tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. So it's got to be in today. There, there is no if, buts or what. So they shut the arena tonight. And with this oversized load, Yogi and Amanda have to be off the road before dark. That gives them just three hours to drive 230 difficult kilometres. It's pretty low trees. You know, it's, it's a constant changing surface. First 100 k's is the hardest 100 k's on this job. And it's about to get even harder. It's got some roadworks up here. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That little element we've got to deal with, you know. Just got 3.8 coming through, mate. Yeah, can you pull up up there and I'll get into his way? Yep, no worries. Recent heavy rains have damaged this road. Yeah, you can die on, mate. Yeah, look, as far as if you um, keep as far left as you possibly can without going over the right hand edge, you're pretty soft. Yeah, no worries, bud, thank you. I don't really like hearing that. If these soft shoulders give way, his whole load could go over. This will be a little bit tight, I reckon. I reckon right where old mate is is a nice soft spot, so, yeah. safely on solid ground. We're working hard today. It's been a tough 12 hours, but finally, Yogi's on the home straight. We are here at Wajin Ularama. All that remains is a nerve-wracking inspection by the owner. So if you're happy, I'm happy. Yeah, no, that's good, mate. Another satisfied customer. Yeah, good job. Oh, steady! And one less ball in the juggling act of Yogi's life. Well, old man is going to bolt. Go, go and get kids up. Go pick up the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't stop. So you're cooking me dinner. <laughs> Car wrecks by the thousands. Broken down, left to rust, worthless rubbish. But not to this man. 
We like to think of ourselves as recyclers. We give everything a chance to be recycled for what it is. Russell Madonna makes his living salvaging the scrap from dead cars. His mission, to clean up the outback with his special self-built mobile car crusher. Now, Russell and his wife, Nikki, have won one of the biggest jobs of their careers. Their task, to clear two football fields worth of cars, white goods and junk. From Alice Springs, Russell and his team will head 450 kilometres southwest to the township of Yulara. The job might be huge, but the margins are skinny. Scrap steel prices are at an all-time low. It's going to be quite a challenge trying to make any money out of this job because of the price of scrap metal. To turn a profit, Russell needs to get in and out in just four days. But slowing him down, 53 metres of machinery and equipment. I would have liked to have had a bit of a practice run before we went out, but time's not really permitting. Not helping matters, Russell's got a rookie crew. Hitching a trailer is trucking 101. But his new students have just failed. Don't let me move. All right? Well, that's got to be slipping in. That's got to be in. All right? So, don't we get out to bed, these fellas? And the lock didn't go in. And they all looked at it. Yeah, all right. Don't tell me that. As an oversized load, he must be off the road before sundown. That's three and a half hours away, and there's still 300 kilometres to drive. The third trailer is like pulling a dead log. It takes everything up to its maximum. It's a bit of an uphill drag here, and um, the old girl's gone up to about 100 on the water temperature here. About 500 on the exhaust. Okay, keep an eye on it. We haven't pulled this much weight for a while. Oh, that's what you call overheating. Okay, critical. So I can see the crest here. It's downhill after here. Rapidly, these temperatures that I'm talking about have fallen dramatically just in a short period of rolling down this hill. From here on, it's flat road. But Russell can't relax yet. We can never really be complacent. Anything can happen at any given time. After a hard day's trucking... We've just got in here, it's just before dark. He's made it. Tomorrow, we get in amongst the program that we're here for. Next morning, something Russell wasn't expecting in the desert. Rain. With a tight deadline, it's the last thing he needs. This weather is going to put us behind. The machine can sort of keep working. It's not ideal, though. If this machine runs out of oil, the, the pumps run dry, the, the whole thing would be buggered. Russell McDonough's car crusher has sprung a major oil leak at the worst possible moment. With 300 cars still to crush and barely a day to do it, he needs it working now. Well, we haven't used this machine for a couple of years. A couple of hoses come loose and I was just able to get up there and tighten them up. I'll just keep a close eye on it. To get this job done on time, Russell decides to drive the loader and give the crusher to one of his apprentices. Do you want to do it? Probably the first car, you, you can just hit it and go straight back to the top. Just yeah. bang yeah. and back up, you know what I mean? It's a calculated risk. <laughs> Thank you. 
but the rookie and the crusher are stepping up. We've been mucking around getting these ready. Now we've started, we're into it. Yeah, we did on the hydraulics has worked. The crushers in a feeding frenzy. The bodies are piling up. We've near enough finished our job here, just waiting on trucks. Russell's made good on his end of the bargain. Dragging a young team. And old gear. Through a mountain of hard work. This weather is going to put us behind. To bring a famous landscape a little closer to its natural state. Yeah, I think we cracked it. After two years, we, um, I think we can still do it. Trucking veteran Steve Graham's rushing to put a road train together. He's just accepted an urgent job, taking a power station worth half a million dollars to a remote Aboriginal community in the tropical north. It's desperately needed to upgrade the town's electricity supply, vital infrastructure for a community way off the grid. The whole community is sweating on how I go delivering this thing. It's an epic 3,000 kilometre slot, reuniting Steve with an old enemy, the Tanami track. And Steve struggling to keep a close eye on his concrete. This road has been shaking and rattled them a bit. I've got no idea what's going on back there. And that's still nice and tight. That's good to see. The slabs are holding fast. But now Steve spotted something else. Shit. That's a problem. The diesel generator has sprung a leak. Whatever Johnny thought he plugged up in there yesterday, I don't think it's plugged up today. Damaged goods damages Steve's reputation. That is a mess. It's a big leak. And the worst of the Tanami is yet to come. The people of remote Balgo are counting on the generator being in perfect working order. It's a blow so close to the finish line. I've got 30 k's to go in there. I'm inclined. I'm inclined to not even open that cabinet door. I'm going to go to Balgo with it and sort it out there. But now, Steve's hit the worst section of the entire trip. Corrugations are the one thing that sends every truck driver spare. Threatening to make the spill even worse. All I can do is walk this load in. I reckon I've got the town down to about three kilometres now. It's feeling like an awfully long three kilometres. It's make or break for Steve. I'm moving up and down like this. And his freight. You can imagine what's going on back there on those trailers. All right, I'm here. After a marathon six days at the wheel, Steve's beaten the wet season and the Tanami and made it to Balgo. I'm a happy man. But the job's not done until his freight is safely unloaded. Steve's hauled a side-lifting crane, thousands of kilometres, especially for the job. But it's not working. Something's not right. The chain connecting the container to the crane has jammed. This time, help is at hand. That chain there, mate. I'll just take a bit of pressure off it. He tries again to lift the container to free the chain but it won't budge. Right, shut the crane out. I'm locked out now. Right, eh? 
After 3,300 gruelling kilometres, the faulty side lifter could now bring the entire job undone. See, nothing. Everything's shut out. And every passing minute in the blistering heat is pushing Steve to breaking point. What are we going to do now? Shut it down again and f him on home. He's running out of options. So either a fuse, or I've got to turn the isolator on and off, and that resets it. We'll just check these fuses first. But you think you've got to get the weight off here first, wouldn't you? Well, you'd reckon it would, but it won't. When all else fails, turn it off. I think there's a reset button here. And on. It's fixed. After nearly 3,500 brutal kilometres. Now, mate, can you tell me if that moves straight away as soon as this one moves? A simple reboot. Beautiful. Has done the trick. It's been a marathon run, but this outback legend has done it yet again. There's a big hole, gaping hole right up the middle of the box board. You joke. Dodging endless disasters. They've got some damage done to them already. To deliver a much needed power station. I want to have a look in here and see if I can see what the diesel lean leak is. It might just be diesel venting out. I don't think there's anything of concern about. There's no major obvious hemorrhages. That's beautiful, mate. Thank no, you. No worries, Cobber. I'm glad you got it. But there's one last check. You're going to grab a spanner, look in that container. This is when it'll go quiet. Before Steve Graham can call job done. Ooh, that's a relief. The switch room's in mint condition. It's always a damn good feeling that he gets in and you open the door and there's a nice new switch room sitting there. Steve can start the long road home. And life for the remote community of Balgo can go on.